Well, let's start with tax cuts uh, because you were in the center of that and we talked to you about it during the process. Uh, now that it's over, as you look at Ohio and the companies in Ohio, are you surprised by the reaction of employers? Uh, honestly, I'm encouraged. Um, I guess I'm surprised by the fact that it's happened so quickly. I just spent a few days in Ohio talking to small business uh, leaders all over the state. I was um, in a roundtable discussion with a bunch of guys who brew beer <laughs> and thought they'd focus more on those issues. Instead, they're talking about immediate expensing, the lower rate, what it means in terms of them being able to expand. Um, in one case, uh, a brewer has never been able to offer health care before. Now he's using the tax savings to offer health care insurance. And you hear it all over the state. I, I know there are a number of companies that have announced big changes, including bonuses and pay increases and contributions to 401ks uh, and expensing, uh, you know, adding much more uh, input into investment and equipment and productivity of workers. But these smaller companies are the ones <laughs> we're not hearing from, but they're out there and it's making a huge difference. And I think that long term is going to make the biggest difference, investment and smaller businesses. So that's that sounds very encouraging. At the same time, is there a little part of you that has a little bit of ambivalence about it? Because you've always been very uh, concerned about the deficit. You've been very responsible on fiscal matters. We're running up a very big deficit. We've increased the deficit. Does that give you some pause? It doesn't for the very reason we talked about. You know, I knew it would lead to economic growth over time. I didn't know what happened so quickly, but exactly what I'm seeing. And I mentioned investment earlier. I think the long-term effect of this is something we haven't seen yet, which is substantially more investment here rather than elsewhere. Again, this leads to higher productivity, which mm -hmm. economists will tell you is uh, our lagging indicator over the last decade or so. Wages are starting to go up. I mean, all the things that you would expect to happen that will result in the end in more revenue. One percent increase in GDP, as you know, is $2.7 trillion more in federal revenues. And, and I think at the end of the day, over the longer period, we're going to see an increase in revenue through growth, which is where you want to see it. It also gives us a stronger position with an economy growing at mm -hmm. two and a half to three percent rather than one and a half to two percent uh, to be able to do something about the long-term debt. So, deficit. Senator, it seems like you agreed then with what Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said last week, which was basically you can get wage growth without inflation because you're going to get productivity from the tax cuts. Now, the majority of people we spoke to didn't agree with that. They said it's not a given that productivity is going to pick up. There are structural factors. And if that doesn't happen, you could, we could be looking at big-time inflation. What do you think? Well, we'll see. I mean, productivity is going to be driven by investments in technology and new equipment. And i got to tell you, Alex, I'm seeing it. I mean, li literally, I go to a small business and they say, here is a machine that was built in 1986, same time the last tax code was substantially reformed, and here 31 years later we're going to replace it with another, you know, $1.5, $2 million machine. This is a relatively small business, but those workers then will be more productive. They'll be able to compete better with, in their case, a foreign competition. It's a small sort of precision manufacturer in the Cincinnati area. So that's, that's productivity, and each worker in that place now will be more productive. So I think productivity, <clears throat> which has been the lag lagging indicator and which economists worry about, is going to increase because of this tax bill. And I think also our competitive position relative to a very competitive global economy is going to be better. So let's talk about another expertise of yours, which is trade. You were our trade representative for some time. Uh, we have NAFTA negotiations resuming in Mexico City today. What do you hear as a senator? What are you hearing about how those negotiations are going? How do you think we can move forward with NAFTA to reform it, but not to throw it out? Yeah, as a former negotiator, it always uh, looks darkest before the dawn, uh, <laughs> as, as, as they say. But I think, although we haven't heard a lot of positive things about progress in the negotiations, I think, you know, we've touched gloves and, and hopefully going to make progress on some specific issues that all three countries should care about. Modernizing NAFTA is very important, but we've got to keep it. I mean, this is an agreement that is critical to my home state of Ohio. Twenty-five percent of our workers in the factory area, uh, you know, manufacturing workers are now export workers. Our number mm -hmm. one market by far is Canada. Mexico's number two. Mm -hmm. We send half of our exports to those two countries. One out of every three acres planted in Ohio is now exported. So for farmers pricing, which is a big issue right now in rural areas in Ohio, we need to keep those exports up. So we don't want these countries, Canada and Mexico, to look to other supply chains. It's hard to claw, claw back those markets once you lose them. Many of us have made this point, as you know, to the president that, yes, we can improve it and we should, and there's some specific things that can and should be done, but let's not walk away from an agreement that's critical to our economic future. Uh, steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs. What's your base case for what tariffs we'll see and how they will be implemented? All countries or targeted countries? 
We'll see. I'm, as you know, We'll promoting... see. You can't only say it once in one interview. Well, <laughs> I mean, who knows, Alex? I mean, I, I've heard all sorts of different things. And, you know, With your experience, what would be the most beneficial? Most beneficial would be targeted, not just to country, but to product. And I'll give you an example of this. In the electrical steel area, we have one manufacturer left, AK Steel, very important having electrical steel because we need it for transformers and for our grid. It's a national security issue. Uh, they have told me there's a 101% increase in imports of that product just in the last year alone. And if this 232 investigation doesn't lead to some relief for them, small part of the market, but a really important part, you know, they're going to be forced to go out of business. So that's an example where we do need to deal with some of the areas. I think another one is, is oil country products, uh, tubular products, pipes. There again, we've had a substantial increase in imports in the last year and a lot of pressure coming not directly from China always, but usually indirectly. Uh, China's capacity um, is well beyond what they need for their own market, that overcapacity issue. By the way, 14 years ago, China was, what, maybe 15% of the global uh, manufacturing of steel. Now it's half of the steel, more than half the steel in the world is produced in one country. They don't need it. They're pushing it out. Much of it is at below their cost, which is dumping. Um, almost all of it is subsidized, which is also illegal under international trade rules. So. We do need to address this issue, but we have to do it in a way that we ensure that it's targeted so that we're not increasing these costs substantially on the economy, on the processors of steel. And finally, given what's gone on in this country since Valentine's Day, we have to talk about gun legislation for a moment. Uh, this is right at the top of the news agenda, the national agenda. Uh, you have been a staunch defender of the Second Amendment. You've gotten a lot of support from the NRA, frankly. Uh, are you rethinking your position? Because in the past, you've resisted some of the proposals for in really increasing the background checks. Are you rethinking your position? Should the Congress rethink its position? Well, I think Congress will act, and I am a co-sponsor of legislation to tighten the background checks. Uh, I support background checks. And I think that will happen now. Um, I think also when you look at what happened in this tragic incidents in Florida, there were so many mixed, missed signs. I mean, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable as you look into it more in terms of what law enforcement missed, what the FBI missed for that matter. And so you needed to tighten up the enforcement side as well. But background checks, yes. Bump stocks is something that it was more focused on the Las Vegas shooting, of course. But that's 21 something. years old, do you have to be in order to get it? I think raising the age is something we should look at. I do, uh, with, with regard to these rifles. And look, I, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here to find some bipartisan consensus and actually move forward on something. But it's also a deeper issue. You know, it does have to do with mental health. And there are people falling between the cracks. It does have to do with our broader cultural issues uh, and the violence that all of our children are yeah. being exposed to constantly. That's, that's different than when you and I grew up.